Hello everyone. It's Thursday. Uh, week's moving right along. Uh, well, we are uh, going to, to jump back into our uh, Word Go Bible study from Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 11 to 26 is our topic for today. and uh, We're going to see some contrast between what's going on in Samuel's life and you know the young child uh, that Hannah had left at the temple for uh, for him to serve God with his life, and uh, then between uh, between him and Eli, the the uh, pr- chief priest's uh, uh, sons, who uh, were being trained sort of probably similar ways, but they they were uh, uh, not doing what what God wanted them to do. So let's uh, let's read this passage. It's First Samuel two, uh, verses eleven uh, to twenty six. It begins this way. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah. Uh, that's, that's Samuel's dad. But the boy ministered before the Lord under the Eli the priest. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. In other words, he probably wanted to grill it instead of boiling it. And so he wanted it to be, probably had a little more flavor. We've still had the fat on it. Uh, One of the things, you know, about fat is considered to be, uh, good. We like fat, uh, but but the way that, you know, whenever you're preparing meat or whatever, you want some of that fat to, to burn off and, and get into the meat and, and make it nice and juicy and good. But but in this case, they're boiling the meat, the, the, the fat, it, it actually was on purpose so that the fat would, uh, that was the fir- the best, so it was being offered to God. And then sort of the priest got whatever was left over. And it's kind of an interesting part of this whole story, how, how this all worked. Well, uh, the, the Eli's sons didn't like that, so they went ahead and, and took the meat before it could get boiled and the fat could come out of it as an offering to God. In other words, they're wanting the first and the best uh, compared to what uh, uh, they were being given when they got secondhand sort of after it had been boiled and the fat had come out of it. Uh, so anyway, let's get back to this. It says, give, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person uh, said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. In other words, we're going to have it our way or you know, no way. Uh, his sons are, are really, it's a symptom of their sin. So this sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt, uh, and they were wanting what's best instead of giving it to God. Uh, what the people were offering to, to God, they were taking for themselves. Uh, verse 18, But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. Uh, uh, and here's the, the comparison. We're comparing uh, Samuel to these two, two sons of Eli. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod, uh, in other words, he's dressing like the priest. He's kind of like a priest. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she pre- she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. I mentioned this is kind of this whole deal with the meat is kind of a symptom of, of a deeper uh, sinfulness to them. Well, they're doing they're sleeping with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting, something they obviously should not be doing. So he said to them, "Why do you do such things?" I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. 
And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Now, again, you see this comparison, Eli's sons with Samuel, and uh, how this is all playing out. And it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, here are the questions that they have here. I'll just mention them quickly. It says, how does Eli respond to his son's sins? What do his actions say about his greatest loves? Uh, in a way, when he brings it up to his sons, it's not about necessarily, I mean, he kind of mentions their sin, but he also talks about, well, I'm hearing this from other people, and it's almost like he cares more about what other people are thinking than, than what God God thinks. And, and for sure, I mean, he doesn't ever really uh, do anything to them. He just sort of brings it up to him and expects that to be enough, but it isn't. And he sort of allows it to keep going. And maybe he like I, I don't know, they mentioned in here a little bit that uh, maybe he liked the meat that they were getting and the way they were getting it without it being boiled first. And, uh, you know, he didn't like that. So, or he liked that, so he wanted it to keep going. I don't, I don't know about that. But anyway. And then the second question says, describe Eli's sons and their sins. What truths about the consequences of sin do you see? And they mention here Leviticus 7, 28 to 36 gives God's laws for priests offering sacrifice. Uh, they're, they're sinning against God. And there's a number of sins that are going on there that they're doing. And it's, it's not good. These are the, the priests. These are supposed to be the leaders. And they're, they're not being, uh, well, not being the leaders. They're, they're sinning. Well, let's go to the notes. And I'll read this for you. Uh, the first section is called Eli's Sons and Their Sins. After Hannah's prayer, verse 11 confirms the separation of Samuel from his family. Elkanah returns home to Ramah with all the rest, but the boy remains in Shiloh. He will serve the Lord under Eli the priest. At this point, Scripture turns to contrast Samuel against the wicked behavior of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. God's word judges Eli's sons as scoundrels with no regard for the Lord. Uh, that's pretty pretty rough stuff. That's pretty big uh, uh, you know, pretty strong words that they have for them. It says, what tragedy for any any believing parent or person involved in the care of the next generation. In other words, had to be hard on Eli that this was happening with his his kids, they're, that they're considered scoundrels and all, and no regard for the Lord. And yet they're the priests. That's, that's the hard thing to understand. It says, God's laws provided food for the Levitical priests through offerings presented as sacrifices to the Lord. Customarily, priests plunged forks into boiling pots of meat at the appropriate time, they took for themselves whatever the fork brought up. That was what was to be their portion. That's what they were to, to eat. However, verses 15 and 16 explain how Eli's sons habitually abuse their positions. They take the best meat for themselves before it's burned as an offering to God. People wanting to offer a righteous sacrifice would plead to first burn the fat to the Lord. In other words, the, the people were offering this, and before they had a chance for it to actually be taken and accepted, uh, these, these two priests, these two sons of Eli, were taking it and, and fixing it themselves. And, and it's interesting, you know, you can just imagine the people that here, they're providing this sacrifice to the Lord and, and sort of wanting it to be the, the primary thing. Now we know the Lord understands uh, their heart. It's not against them that, that God has a problem, but, but it had to be, be a, a burden to them to realize that, that uh, you know, God was not receiving what he was supposed to be receiving. Uh, you can just imagine what that might be like. Uh, you know, they, they would plead to, to, to first burn the fat to the Lord. But, but Hophni and Phinehas would threaten, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. Who dares to treat God's people? This is the question they have here. Who dares to treat God's people and their offsprings or, or their offerings to him with contempt? Because that's really what Hophni and Phinehas are doing here. They're, they're contempt. They have contempt for, first of all, for these people, but also for God uh, in, in this whole section. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty harsh here. Uh, it says, they blaspheme God in their oppressive power, greed, and gluttony. That's what it was all about. Uh, no doubt part of it was about power and greed. They wanted that meat. They wanted the best of the meat. And so they, you know, it's kind of their gluttony. They're, they want it. And so they're going to take it. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty rough situation here. The second section says Samuel and his family. Now, Scripture turns back to Samuel and his family. While Eli's adult sons selfishly live day after day to get what they can, young Samuel gives his all. He is ministering before the Lord, obediently serving as Eli directs. In other words, he's, he's growing in the Lord. He's, he's becoming more and more of the servant that God wants him to be, and it's really a, a, really a cool thing. I mean, he's this young kid, and yet he's, he's, he's really serving the Lord, Lord here. 
Verse 18 describes him as a boy wearing a linen ephod. Uh, the linen ephod is a garment traditionally worn by priests. That's what they were to wear, and, and here he is. And I, it makes me think of like a, you know, like a, a, you know, a junior bride in a wedding or something. I, I think about Molly was that for my sister Amy, and and you know she was dressed up kind of like her in, in the wedding and, and kind of the junior junior bride. So here here's uh, uh, you know uh, young Samuel. He's he's a, a junior priest, and he's he's doing the things that priests do, but yet as a kid and he's learning how to do these things and and it's it's just a neat kind of a neat thing it says notice how hannah and elkanah faithfully persevere in devotion to god and samuel's devotion to service in other words they they keep coming back uh, no doubt they wanted to see their son but but part of it sh i'm sure was was being faithful to to god and and just continuing that and uh, for sure samuel is is devoted to to his service to god it says hannah makes samuel a little robe a little in the ephod each year to give samuel when the family comes to shiloh to worship god uh, she probably had to make him a new one each year because he kept getting bigger and you know older and stuff so he needed a bigger a bigger one but it says certainly hannah prayed for her son's protection and growth so during these annual trips, Eli would bless Elkanah and Hannah with, his, with this beautiful prayer. May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she shared uh, for and gave to the Lord. She prayed for and, and gave to the Lord. And the Lord did bless them, not only with Samuel and the Lord's service, but also with three more sons and two more daughters. Uh, year after year, as Samuel's family grew in Ramah, he grew up in the presence of the Lord. Uh, he kept learning more and more and more. Uh, even though he is surrounded by corruption, God is with Samuel and has a purpose for him. And in this last section, it says choices and cons uh, consequences. A third wave of, of comparison arises in verses 22 to 25. Stories of his son's wickedness circulating in the community reach Eli's ear. He hears about their greed for sacrificed meat and sexual sins with female servants. So Eli confronts his sons about their ongoing uh, sins. His question intends to strike at their hearts. If one person sins against together, another, God may me, uh, mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? In other words, God might help you out if you're just, you know, it's against somebody else or whatever. Uh, he might come to, you know, be, be sort of mediate for you. But, but if it's with God, who, who's going to mediate for you? There's no one to do that. No one will help you with that. You're on your own on that. But this undisciplined, but his undisciplined, disrespectful sons remain unrepentant and deaf to his rebuke. Eli should have removed them from the priesthood, uh, or you know, at least done something more than what he did. But he fails to do so. Eli's unfaithfulness to God leads to unintended, unimagined consequences for everyone he loves and even his nation. And uh, we'll see that as we move forward. Says, now it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to understand, you know, these guys are not, not good. They're full of these sinful actions and, and no doubt their hearts were, were, were rotten to the core pretty much. They were not being faithful. They had no, no desire to do what God wanted them to do. Even taking, taking other people's sacrifices for themselves. Uh, this is in the starkest possible contrast. Verse 26 reports the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with with people, uh, that should be all of our goals. You know, each one of us should have that goal in our life that we are always seeking to constantly grow uh, in stature and in favor with God and with people. Uh, that's that's what we need to be about. That's what our 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 lives, the direction of our lives, should always be growing, taking our next step in, in the Lord. No matter how many steps we've taken with the Lord, some it's it's been a long time. Uh, but there's always a next step. It says, what patterns in life are you establishing with your thoughts leading to words and deeds? Uh, in other words, how, what, what are you doing in your life to make sure that you are growing, that you're continuing on this path of, of keeping our faith growing, uh, of, of taking that next step with the Lord? What are we doing? What patterns in our life? You know, i uh, there's lots of things you can do, you know, watching these, these devotionals would be one or getting the word go app or getting the, the Bible, uh, version Bible app or anything. There's lots of different things you can do, uh, related to that. And, uh, that'll help you develop patterns, uh, and that'll help lead you in the way that you need to go, that God wants you to go.
It says, reject the pattern of Hophni and Phinehas, uh, recognize and quickly repent of sin. In other words, just refuse to, to go down that path of, of sin. Carefully consider the consequences for misrepresenting God. Uh, there are consequences, and, and we need to be aware of those. And we need to, to uh, make sure we're doing what we need to be doing and to, to follow the Lord. Well, let's pray together. Lord, uh, thank you uh, for this lesson. Thank you again for your word. Help us, Lord, to... Uh, to follow you, to serve you, to uh, develop the patterns in our life that will keep us connected to you and keep us growing, keep us taking our next step in you. And uh, the, the blessings will um, just continue to flow. You, you are faithful to, to do that. If we uh, stay connected to you, you, you will impart your grace, uh, the means of grace. Lord, help us to, uh, uh, to, to just live with you in our constantly in our heart and mind seeking your will seeking your leading uh, lord help us with this lord i lift up all those that need a touch from you all those dealing with covid right now uh, we we lift up uh, uh, doctors and nurses and first responders lord we just pray your blessing on them and the numbers just continue to climb and just pray your protection for them be with the kids in the school and the teachers and the workers and, and all involved there, Lord. Keep them safe and help them each and every day as they do what they we, they need to do. Uh, Lord, we lift up those that are sick, those that need a touch from you, those that need encouraging today. Just be very near to them. Thank you, Lord. We just be, always be careful to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thanks for watching again today, and uh, we'll see you see tomorrow. Uh, we've got our, our ham and bean lunch at the church from 11 to 1. And uh, be sure and, and come by if you can. Uh, we're going to have some good ham and beans and cornbread and uh, some other stuff, applesauce and water. I don't know what else we're going to have. Cookie, I think, maybe. Uh, but you have a great, great uh, rest of your day. And we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.